Um, my name is Zoe Opocic and I'm welcoming you into the second of our 12-week series of lectures on urban governance and civic participations in Word and Stone. Uh, and I want to welcome you on behalf of myself here from Berkeley College, but also Kathleen Sender from CEU and Susanne Rao from uh, Erfurt University. Um, I'm really delighted tonight to be able to introduce uh, a former colleague of mine, formerly at, at Bugbeck, but I mean, still colleague of mine, generally speaking, Caroline Goodson, who is a senior lecturer in early medieval history in Cambridge, but as I said, was previously a uh, very esteemed and much like member of Bugbeck's Department for History, Classics and Archaeology. Uh, Caroline is very well known for her work on Rome the city she knows very well and where she has actually lived for a, a number of years, uh, partly as uh, her PhD research, which she completed at the Columbia University in something like, I think, 2004. So her work on early medieval Rome, which also extends to Italy and Western Mediterranean, has two particular strands, I would say. One is at looking at the role of, of the past and also of innovation um, following the fall of the Roman Empire. And this uh, interest that she has in the nature of power has also led perhaps to her second strand, which is uh, of a particular interest for, from our perspective here today. And that is the role of cities, especially cities as loci of so a social interaction, of political authority and of changing religious practices. And I think some of these themes have been explored in her book uh, the Rome of Pope Paschal I, 817 to 824, Papal Power, Urban Renovation, Church Rebuilding and Relic Translation, which was published with CUP in 2010. Um, her latest book, and it's really very much hot off the press, also with CUP, published this year, uh, is entitled Cultivating the City in Early Medieval Italy. And this cultivation is really in very literal sense because it focuses in particular on Italian urban gardens and their role in transforming uh, Roman ideas into medieval social, economical and cultural values. So, um, you know, really extremely well placed to um, give our a lecture tonight on Mediter Mediterranean cities in early Middle Ages. Now, Caroline, uh, we can see you very well, and if you unmute yourself, we'll be able to hear you very clearly. I just want to say before you start that um, uh, I'm very much looking forward to your paper, uh, but I will have to sign off at half past in order to go and teach myself. So I'll hand over to a part of our team, Team Maria Kuprovska, who will carry over with the q and I'll explain how that works. So over to you, Caroline. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you for that introduction. And, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to pull up uh, my PowerPoint and share my screen with you. Yeah. Uh, so I've got some images to talk to. Now, um, I've approached the topic of this evening's lecture as a, a bit of a um, whistle-stop tour through a bunch of different cities in the early medieval Mediterranean to try and develop ideas about um, what are the commonalities and what are the differences, the different trajectories that post-Roman cities took, um, mostly, mostly in the West. I'll start with Constantinople, but I'll also look at Marseille, at Cordoba in Al-Andalus and uh, southern Italian cities, Rome included, um, but I won't spend much time on Rome. Uh, I'll also think about uh, Karawan in Ifriqiya to try and give a perspective of from around the Mediterranean of, of early medieval urban dynamics. And the theme of this lecture course, of course, is uh, urban governance and civic participation. And uh, I'm going to spend, I'm going to find myself talking, I think, a bit more about urban governance than about civic participation. And in my concluding remarks, I'm going to try and explain a little bit about why I've taken that decision and what we might do if we want to explore some of the other ideas about um, uh, or other angles of civic participation. <clears throat> 
But with that in mind, I'm, I'm going to start. Um, and I, I, I should say, uh, it's a little bit difficult giving a lecture to people that you, you don't know, don't see, and, um, and who are presumably coming from a really big uh, range of backgrounds. So some of what I'm saying may be old hat, completely familiar and old news to you. And I, I hope you'll just bear with me because I'm going to move quite quickly and I'm going to move uh, through quite a lot of, of territory and topography. Um, and hopefully I I can uh, um, uh, uh, attract your attention with something else if you find me um, saying things that you're already familiar with about some places. So I'm going to start um, with something that we surely all know, which is the, the, the fall of Rome and the, uh, the last Roman emperor in the West, Romulus Augustulus, who is um, sent into exile in 476. Um, at that point, the territory from that point, the territories of the Western Roman Empire are not ruled again by an emperor until, of course, Charlemagne is, is crowned in Rome in the year 800. But even then, Carolingian rule uh, only works for a brief period of time and only a small part of the area that had been the Roman Empire. So regional rulership of relatively small territories became the norm from the fifth century onwards. But echoes of the coherent political administration that was the Roman Empire continued to be heard in cities. The structures of imperial administration, which had united the, the provinces and the territories of the Roman Empire, were predominantly urban. And there was a, a really a civic shape to governance in antiquity. And it's very easy, I think, for medievalists uh, to be beguiled by the image of that supreme ruler, which was the Roman emperor, who was a single figure or sometimes a dynasty of, of, of a family of rulers. And indeed, many people in the Middle Ages, that is many rulers of the Middle Ages, emulated that model of the principate as the sort of ideal form of um, a totalitarian uh, monarchy. But when we really dig down into how things worked in, uh, in antiquity and specifically in late antiquity, the practical workings of governance, of taxation, of dispute resolution, all of these took place in provincial capitals. They took place in cities. And social groups were formed and reformed, not at the imperial level, but in cities and in participation in civic administration. After the end of the imperial bureaucracy, cities played a variety of roles in post-Roman kingdoms, uh, some of which we'll look at today. And indeed, in the Eastern Roman Empire, where an emperor continued to, to rule, uh, cities and participation in civic governance remained a key tool of social mobility well into the early Middle Ages. So I'm going to look at life in cities of the early medieval Mediterranean from about 500 to about uh, 1100, really roughly speaking. Um, and I'm going to consider uh, the strategies of governance through urbanism. So let's start in a Roman city. Let's start in, if I can get my computer to cooperate there. So here we are, Eurasia in about 600. I'm going to start in Constantinople. So I'm showing you here two rather schematic plans of Constantinople, first in the time of Constantine, uh, which was the refoundation of Constantinople in the, the, the first half of the fourth century as a new Rome, and then Constant Constantinople in the time of Justinian in the sixth century. Uh, when it was rebuilt uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an imperial capital after a series of riots. Now, one of the things that these um, schematic maps, I think, really make clear is the is significance of um, walls and of processional routes in the urban fabric of Constantinople, right? You can see the land walls of, of, um, of, uh, of the city uh, as the city expands. You get the, the Theodosian walls here of Theodosius II, and you get these major processional routes that move away from the palace district here um, through a series of fora and columns and major monuments. And those processions were, I think, a sort of classic hallmark of the of civic life in Constantinople. 
And I'm going to focus uh, a little bit on the Hippodrome here. Uh, th there it is uh, in the map of, of Constantinople under Constantine. And here is a detailed view of that palace district where you can see the propinquity of Hippodrome to the great palace. Now, obviously, this is this is um, modern Istanbul, and so you can see here how the um, how how the, the modern city sits right on top of the uh, of the ancient and medieval city. So we have to guess at the location of quite a lot of parts of the of the palace, but we don't have to guess at the location of the Hippodrome because we see quite a lot of it preserved in the in the urban fabric of of modern Istanbul. Now, the Hippodrome was the the building dedicated to to chariot races, principally. There was a certain amount of formal presentation. Um, so if you recall in, in the reading that I set for you about Justinian's Constantinople, um, it is in the Hippodrome that Justinian is presented as the new ruler of the city of Constantinople. So it was a place for entertainment, but also a place for the performance of, um, of, of imperial ceremony. The estimates are that the Hippodrome could seat about 100,000 people. Uh, the population of Constantinople in the time of Justinian, so in the middle of the sixth century, is estimated, and these are these are guesstimates. There, there's really no uh, concrete evidence that we could build the the kind of numbers um, of population for these cities. But the guesstimate is that the population of Constantinople at the time of Justinian is four hundred thousand or five hundred thousand. So the Hippodrome could seat a very, a pretty significant proportion of the population. Um, it was an enormous building, an enormous part of the urban fabric, and a very regular and consistent part of the entertainment of the populace. So this relationship between the palace and the and the Hippodrome is something that em emulates uh, what was the case for Imperial Rome, where the Palatine sits right over top of the Circus Maximus, which is the, um, the, the spectacle building for chariot races there. And in the Hippodrome, we get really very clear um, indications of the way in which the Emperor and the Imperial family was perceived, viewed, and, and engaged with the populace of Constantinople. So here I'm showing you um, one of the Egyptian obelisks that was brought by Theodosius I and put in the center of the Hippodrome at Constantinople. And here is an image at the base of that obelisk of uh, Theodosius in the Cathisma, which is the, the viewing box, the imperial viewing box, which was um, uh, enlarged over time, Justinian uh, himself also enlarged it in order to make it more prominent. Um, it, it, it's a very sort of architectural, a very clear architectural feature of the, the, the dominance and, and um, authority of the emperor and his family who are sitting here um, viewing the races. There's an interior staircase that leads from the Cathisma into the great palace. Um, so there's a, a very direct uh, connection, physical connection between the residence of the ruler of the emperor and his participation in the entertainment spectacles of the chariot races. Now, chariot racing is something that has happened in, in Roman society for centuries and centuries by the time we get to Theodosius or to Justinian. And there, ha there are long-standing habits of the, the, the sort of supporters of chariot races um, and of of, of other entertainment spectacles, um, mirroring uh, social groups uh, within the city. So the Dimes are, are kind of social groups, local political parties, but also factions of supporters for, uh, for the races. So famously in, in antiquity, there are, there are four principal teams of chariot racers that go by colors, the blues, the greens, the reds, and the whites. Although by the time we get to Justinian in the sixth century, it's really the blues and the greens who are, who are the most powerful. So as I say, these are kind of local political parties slash neighborhood gangs and quite a lot of political friction or let's say social friction and friction against political rulers or political forces is played out in challenges between circus factions. And so very famously, uh, um, riots erupt in the Hippodrome in 532, the Nika riots, um, 
between circus factions. Um, it's very difficult from our sources to know what exactly the nature of the conflicts are, but this kind of rubbing along um, of, 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 of social frictions um, playing out in terms of competition between teams in the in the chariot races is something that's got a very long history. Um, Justinian, when he came to office, was worried about it and issued laws against um, urban violence. And, in, and indeed, he was critiqued uh, seriously by, 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 uh, by contemporaries for his failure to keep the riots, um, to suppress the riots, um, or just not to suppress them sufficiently quickly. After the riots, he, he uh, added new responsibilities for the urban police to try and suppress this. But one of the things that I think we can see is that um, is that circus factions operated as um, as a as a mode of civic participation in alterity, that is in um, in 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 protest. Now, after the Nika riots, uh, um, the Justinian was able to uh, rebuild uh, the Church of Hagia Sophia. Uh, and then there was a, a, a partial collapse of the dome, and so it was rebuilt again. Now, um, the, the building of Hagia Sophia started in the fourth century, and then it was entirely rebuilt here in the middle of the sixth century. And it is certainly one of the most spectacular buildings of the medieval world. Um, I'm showing you here a view of, of the dome. If you're lying on the floor, um, it, you can look up at the dome and see you've got the central dome and then two side domes uh, branching off of it. Um, and I'm giving you a passage here from Procopius, so a contemporary account of the rebuilt uh, church of Hagia Sophia, in, in which Procopius makes the analogy between the dome of the church and the dome of heaven. So he says upon the, the, the circle, and he's referring to here to this, to this uh, base for the dome, um, rests a huge spherical dome, which makes the structure exceptionally beautiful. Yet it seems not to rest upon solid masonry, but to cover the space with its golden dome suspended from heaven. And this metaphor is used over and over again uh, in accounts of Hagia Sophia. And you can, you can probably see why. It's enormous and it's um, and it's quite striking and it's quite beautiful with the, the way that the light moves through the building. Now, this new church, the great church of Constantinople, occasioned a, a, the, the designing of new liturgy that made quite explicit to the populace of Constantinople and by extension, the empire, the relationship between church and emperor and the relationship between what happened under the rule of the emperor and what happened in the rest of the world. So this analogy of the dome of Hagia Sophia being the dome of heaven was expanded upon and played out in liturgy, whereby what happened under the dome of Hagia Sophia was a microcosm for what happened in the wider world. So there were, there were quite specific liturgical arrangements for the joining together of the patriarch, who's the head of the church in Constantinople, and the, and the ruler and the emperor under the dome, and a kind of sh sharing out of different responsibilities in a very ceremonial and very public way. And these liturgical um, developments Give us, I think, a sense of the way in which ceremony worked to um, create norms and standards for urban governance in Constantinople. And what happens in Constantinople is mirrored. So there are buildings with large central domes like Hagia Sophia that are created from the middle of the sixth century onwards in some of the other major cities uh, throughout the Eastern Roman Empire. Now, the value of these urban ceremonies uh, based on Roman models endured into the Middle Ages. So I'm showing you here a passage from Constantine the Seventh, he's known as Constantine Porphyrogenitus, who ruled from the who ruled in the in the 10th century who was a very learned man uh, who came from a dynasty of, of rulers. He, he was an emperor eventually, and he was a historian. And this passage um, explains what he's doing when he compiles together a list of the ceremonies of, um, of the administration of the empire 
and of the, the ceremonies, the liturgical processions and the religious ceremonies that, that took place. He wanted to avoid disorder so that we may not appear to disgrace the majesty of empire through disorderly conduct. We have thought it necessary to gather together from many quarters the ceremonies invented by men of old or reported by eyewitnesses or seen by us and established in our own times and to set them out in the present work in a form that might be easily understood to preserve for our successors the tradition of inherited customs that have come to be neglected. Culling, as it were, a bunch of flowers from the meadows, we may present it to the imperial splendor as an incomparable ornament. We may place in the middle of our palace something in the nature of a clear and polished mirror, which we will show to the eye all that is proper to the imperial power and to the institute of the Senate, so that we may make possible for the reins of authority to be managed with order and dignity. Hereby may the imperial power be exercised with due rhythm and order and display the harmonious movement imposed by the creator on the universe so that the empire may appear more majestic to our subjects and therefore more acceptable and admirable in their eyes. Now, book two, which apparently covered civic and court ceremonies is lost to us, unfortunately. Um, book one, which we have, gives a really quite rich and often very detailed explanation of liturgical ceremonies that he, Constantine, witnessed or that he had access to, to documents about, just, just as he says. Um, he's, he's not a historian by our standards, that is, he doesn't provide footnotes and he doesn't um, challenge the, the authorial bias that might appear in some of the sources that he's working from, um, but he nonetheless is really quite, um, quite attentive to gathering together the evidence that he has for what people did, and he's interested in how change over time worked in the development of this imperial ceremony. Um, what I want you to come away from Constantinople with is, is the idea that the city and its buildings and the things that happened in those buildings provided a framework for rulership. And by extension, they enabled the populace to be ruled. So these structures, that is, I mean, the frameworks, but also the buildings in which they happened, um, they permitted different forms of participation and administration. They also permitted um, resistance in the form of riots. Now, we could, if we wanted, uh, spend the next 20 minutes thinking about um, uh, processions, cult of relics, the local cults of saints at Constantinople, which were very real parts of, the, um, of civic participation in medieval Constantinople. But I'm going to leave those for, for another day. Those are the things that we perhaps know the most about in terms of participation in Constantinople. And I'm going to think about those kinds of relic translations in, in, another, example, uh, in, in other examples that I'm going to come to shortly. So I'm going to move really quickly on to Marseille and look at a very different city that, that takes a very different trajectory. Now, here is an artist's reconstruction of Marseille in antiquity, and you'll notice the very, the very prominent, um, the, well, the promontory, but also the very um, substantial port, which was developed over the course of the Roman period and then into the Middle Ages. And I'm showing you here also a map of Merovingian centers uh, in, 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 in the seventh century, or the, the later sixth and the early seventh centuries. And you can see Marseille here on the Mediterranean as the sort of southernmost remotest part of the Merovingian kingdom. Now, Marseille is, an, is a really interesting example for us to think about the, the early medieval city, because in a sense, it's almost a non-city after the seventh century. That is, we have textual sources which refer to life in Marseille um, in ways that almost overly emphasize continuity with the Roman period. So for instance, um, we know uh, from Gregory of Tours' Book of Ten Histories um, that we've got uh, men who go by the title prefect or patricius. And these are uh, official titles that had, they, had we been seeing them in the year 400, we would think that they had something to do with imperial administration. By the time we get to the life of Gregory of Tours, the time of Gregory of Tours in the sixth century, it's very unlikely that there's any imperial administration at any of these um, 
these these prefects are having anything to do with but it's still a an important title a designator of social status and some kind of uh, officialness um we have minters or moneyers who appear at Marseille who are working on behalf of the Merovingian kingdom, but they're structuring themselves and their urban professions, not as sort of royal deputies, but as very much in the, in the tradition of late Roman urban officials. Now, we know about these kinds of people from Gregory um Gregory was the the son of a of a senator uh, uh the senator of Clermont whatever whatever senator might have meant um at the uh, at the beginning of the sixth century um it's very unclear but again this is a sort of honorific that's 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 very emphatically drawn connections uh to imperial offices um Gregory's family was clearly um, very high status, and Gregory's family was also very closely connected to a series of bishoprics. Um, in the sixth century is the moment in which we can really clearly see the, the connections between families of long running high status, what would have been called senatorial up until the fifth century. Um, are increasingly taking positions of power within the church. So Gregory's family is very closely associated with the bishops of Lyon um, and, and, and with, other, with other Merovingian centers. And, uh, and Gregory, of, of course, himself eventually becomes uh, the, the, the Bishop of Tours after a, a, a long life in the, in the monastery. Now, the... Um, the other way in which we know about these characters who use these these titles are from their their hagiographies so rather like Gregory who comes from this post senatorial family um, some of the other figures who use these titles of patricius or of prefectus um, are likewise highborn from high status families and who go into ecclesiastical careers and about whom Merovingian hagiography is then composed. So there's a very interesting kind of um, way in which the source base for understanding um, uh, uh, the legacies of imperial administration in Marseille and in other cities of the Merovingian kingdom um, is indebted to um, to, to the to the ways in which those individuals themselves capitalized upon that terminology. The city of Marseille itself, whatever prefects there were and whatever they were actually doing, was hardly an administrative center. It was a trade center. It was very clearly uh, an emporium. It was a, um, a city that was that functioned predominantly around the needs and the practicalities of trade. And so we know about this from archaeology. So there have been great excavations um, in, in several centers, with several parts of the city center of Marseille, um, and even in, in parts of the, of the coastline where, the, where the, the water, the line of the coast has changed such that we're able to see, in sometimes in really great detail, wharves of the Merovingian period and all of the kind of pottery and stuff that was dumped off boats because it broke and wasn't worth taking into town. So Marseille was a, a center of, of great commerce. We get quite a lot of evidence of, of pottery um, from the Eastern Mediterranean, um, from North Africa that arrives in, in Marseille up until the sixth century. And then after that, we get relatively little of that, but we have other glimpses that it's still functioning as this, uh, as an emporium. So one of the things that we see is this quite extraordinary document. It's called the tra Tractorium, which is a, a sort of concession or it's an instruction that's issued by the king, by Chilperic II, in favor of the monastery of Corby. Now, Corby is located way up here in the northernmost parts of the kingdom, but materials uh, that are going to Corby or to an agent from Corby are being uh, moved through 
Marseille or through Foss, which is a very nearby um, coastal uh, uh, port. And what is given to an agent from Corby each year from the, the sort of toll station from the collection at Foss, again, through, through Marseille, right next to Marseille, um, is an enormous sort of basket of Mediterranean goods. Um, so 10,000 pounds of oil. And indeed, we know from other sources that Marseille um, and Foss were the, the principal sources of oil for lamps throughout the Merovingian kingdom. Um, but also very classic Roman um, ingredients like garum, like um, uh, preserved fish sauce and, and pepper and cloves and cinnamon and almonds and olives and uh, forgive me, I've duplicated olives there. Um, chickpeas, as well as rice. Rice is something that is not grown anywhere in the Western Mediterranean. It's something that comes from the Aegean, uh, if not further afield. Um, papyrus, which in the eighth century is uh, out, is without any doubt coming from Egypt, um, as well as ingredients for, for medicine or for incense. So costum, which is there, comes from India. Uh, and it's an ingredient that appears in several of these kinds of lists. So Marseille in the eighth century is still the, the kind of funnel um, the, the in the in tank uh, for the Medi for the um, Merovingian kingdoms of goods from the Mediterranean and beyond, and it is the the sort of outlet of slaves. It was a, a, a it, it appears it's very difficult to know exactly how, um, how how fully developed the slave trade was, but we've got several um, corroborating sources which speak to slaves moving um, through Marseille. So Gregory the Great from Rome goes to get slaves for his Anglo-Saxon missionary project from Marseille. Um, at the at the end of the sixth century. So we've got sort of goods moving in and people moving out of Marseille. We can't really see very much of them, partially because modern Marseille sits on top of what medieval Marseille was, but also the nature of the source material that we have is, um, is this or these hagiographic accounts of these very high status men who are perhaps promoting their own indebtedness to their Roman past. We don't know who made their shoes, who carried their, um, their, their bags of, of um, pistachios, um, who uh, put the roofs on their houses or any of those other kind of aspects of urban life. That's entirely invisible to us in, in the record. So the trajectory of this late Roman city seems to be, by, by many markers, very good. This was a, 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 a center of um, a very long distance trade of cosmopolitaneity in, in some regard, but also very underdeveloped in terms of urban governance and in terms of civic participation. It was perhaps just a trading place. Now, I'm going to move really quickly on to another place where I'm sort of moving around the Mediterranean, and I'm going to move here um, away from Marseille down into Cordoba. So we're going to look at Cordoba, which was the capital of the Umayyad Caliphate of Al-Andalus, and then a major city throughout the Middle Ages uh, in the Islamic period, and, and then indeed um, after the Reconquest. Now, how do we know about Cordoba? Well, some of it is still there. Um, I'll, I'll, here's a map of the city that we're, be, that we're looking at, and this comes from the reading that I set for you by Anne Christie's about topography and the significance of topography at Cordoba. We know a lot about it from a lot, a lot about it from archaeology. So here I'm, I'm showing you um, uh, excavated houses and roads from early medieval Shakunda. That's one of the suburban settlements that's referred to uh, in Anne Christie's article. One of the sort of um, suburban areas that was that that served as a as an external alternative um, to the to the uh, caliphal center uh, of the city. 
And we've got, of course, the, the, the very famous, uh, highly touristed, very photogenic um, building of the Great Mosque at Cordoba. That's the building on the right. The building on the left here is the Great Mosque at Damascus. And I'm putting it there to, to kind of show you the, the way in which the mosque at, at, at Cordoba very deliberately sits, um, make, makes the city relate to the wider um, histories and the wider um, practices of the of the Islamic world. But the building at, um, at Cordoba uh, here is the, is the great mosque is adjacent to the palace and is very, very closely related to the, the center of governance and the, the, the buildings dedicated to the administration and governance of the city of, of Cordoba. Now, what we can tell um, from the textual record of Cordoba, and that's principally what the focus of the reading was, is, is a bit mixed. And one of the things that emerges from this case study, I think, is the significance of genre in thinking about how to understand the workings of cities in the early Middle Ages. So we know a certain amount about, well, in Latin, we know a certain amount about Cordoba because we've got these, these, this Christian community, this persecuted, much persecuted Christian community, which eventually is martyred in the middle of the ninth century. Um, and we've got accounts of their efforts to, um, to persist in their Christian faith against the, the, the tyranny of the Muslim rulers and the sort of antipathy between the Muslims and the, and the Christian communities, and then their eventual um, uh, suppression in the middle of the ninth century. Uh, we've got John of Gortz, who famously comes to Cordoba to the court in the 10th century and is sort of held hovering um, as a, a, a sort of waiting his, his audience with, uh, with the caliph. Um, and, and then we have quite a lot of Arabic writing. We've got Arabic writing that was produced in Cordoba of a whole range of, of different types. And about the city itself, we've got geographers, geographies, and chronicles. Now, what we can learn from Anne Christie's analysis of those geographies and those chronicles is that the that, that genre in Arabic writing was incredibly, um, it dictated form and sometimes content quite heavily. The same probably can be said of, of Latin sources, uh, but she's made this case, I think, quite forcefully with the, with the Arabic sources. By which I mean that geographers give accounts of the cities of the Islamic world, um, not necessarily based on firsthand experience or new information, but sometimes in a compendium and a gathering, and they use discussions of cities as ways to talk about sameness and otherness, about communities, and about the imam, the, 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 the community of the faithful. And so when one reads a geographer um, for the first time, one thinks this is great. It's filled with all kinds of detail about where the libraries were and how many mosques and how many baths there were in the city. But when you read a lot of geographers, you realize that the structure of the texts and the expectations of the readers um, means that there's quite a lot of repetition and quite a lot of information there that may not be novel or peculiar or unique to the case that's being discussed. And the other case, the other point that Anne made in that reading that I set for you was that topography carried a very specific resonance in writing about Cordoba. And so when one reads the, the really extensive textual um, uh, dossier that we have for early medieval Cordoba, you can see consistently um, sections which come up uh, or, 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 or toponyms or place names which come up and which seem to have had uh, really specific um, connotations, sometimes of inclusion and sometimes of exile. So there are areas outside the walls for, for exiled members of the community. And there are sections of, um, of alterity. So Shakunda, this area here from which I showed you the excavations uh, plan, excavated plan a little while ago, is an area out of which con considerable numbers of revolts seem to emerge. Um, and that might be true, or that might be a, um, 
a development of the um, of, of the literature around the chronicles, but what it signifies is that there was factionalism around the city of, of Cordoba, and so we need to be really attentive to what our authors are telling us and what where they got their information from and what they're trying to convey about topography uh, of the city of Cordoba and by extension of other cities. Now, this is something that emerges very clearly when we look at the cities of southern Italy. And I'm going to take you very quickly here to southern Italy. Here are two maps of Italy in the early Middle Ages. And what I want to focus on is this area right here. So the area between Rome and Benevento and Naples. Now, I'll, I'll start here with a, a, an account from the 10th century of John, who's a deacon from Naples, who discovered the body of the martyr Sausius in a ruined church on Mycenaeum. And there you can see the, the promontory of Mycenaeum. And he explained that Mycenaeum had been sacked by Saracen raiders and that no one knew what had become of the body of the blessed martyr Sausius. Um, who had been a companion of Gennaro, the famous Gennaro, um, whose, whose body had been stolen from Naples uh, by the Prince of Benevento in, in about 15 years before. Now, John uh, had joined an expedition to go out to, to Mycenaeum, um, and he found the, the, the church in ruins, but then he found a mosaic panel with an image and an inscription on it and opened it up, and lo and behold, there was the miraculously preserved body of, uh, of Sosius wearing a martyr's crown. And um, uh, uh, beautiful odors, uh, beautiful odors em emanated from the tomb. And then, you know, uh, the, the, it was entirely clear that this was, of course, Sosius, and the body was removed um, and taken uh, and taken eventually back into Naples, where it went into the church of San Severinus and Sosius. It stopped for a minute here at San Severino while the church was being built, and then it moved in 907 into the church of San Severino and Sosius. Now, what's going on here is, a, is, is one example of the translation of relics, which is perhaps a very familiar account um, of, of how communities build uh, collective identities around cult figures in the Middle Ages. You could look at, at, at many other cities for the translation of relics. Um, what we've got in the particular case of southern Italy is an area of enormous political factionalism. So fights between Benevento uh, and Naples go on and on from the end of the 8th century into the 10th century and indeed even beyond, but they become really quite heated in this period of the 9th and the early 10th centuries. And relics and the translation of relics into cities is, is, is a phenomenon that emerges in the middle of the 8th century at Rome and then expands to these other cities here. So I'm showing you a couple of other examples here. Here's the body of Gennaro that's stolen from Naples and taken to Benevento, to which it is and it's joined with the body of, uh, of the Apostle Bartholomew, which is taken from Lipari, from an island. And other saints are brought from the territories of Benevento. Um, so here from these areas of, of what we now think of as, as, as Puglia, um, and they're all brought from outposts to the city centers and to the, um, to the ducal palace and the, the royal buildings of, of Benevento, the Church of St. Sophia in particular. Now this there's a way in which we can think about this as a sort of um, a centripetal force of the ruler sucking the relics up from enemy states, but also from their own territories into city walls. And there's usually a rhetoric of, of threat, either the Muslims or the Lombards or the Romans or someone else is, is threatening the relics. Um, and that, that provides the impetus or the excuse for the consolidation of all of this saintly, uh, numinous authority into the city walls. Um, but it's something that happens very, very consistently in this particular community over a series of decades. And so it's really quite striking to think about this from a topographic level. So here I'm showing you a map that I made of Rome of the translation of relics from, um, from extramural shrines 
into city churches that happens, as I say, from the middle of the eighth century, but then with enormous frequency, um, specifically under Pope Paschal and at the beginning of the ninth century. And here hiding under these little images, I'm sorry, I'm afraid that the, the PowerPoints are, are partially obscured by our Zoom, um, but perhaps you'll be able to consult this later. This is an, an inscription in the Church of Santa Prasede listing the saints that have been brought from these extramural shrines into this urban church by Pope Paschal I. So this gathering up under bishop or under deacon or under ruler, under prince, because that's sometimes what happens at Benevento, is a strategy that's very consistently employed for the communities of Southern Italy, where the territories are magnetically sucked into the urban fabric and provide a new landscape of sanctity within city walls over the course of the ninth and the 10th centuries. Now, I want to quickly move to, uh, to, to North Africa and then to draw up some conclusions. Now, I want to look really quickly at Kairouan, uh, um, which you might be able to see in this sort of forest of, of, of the cities of Byzantine and early Islamic North Africa here. I'll show you a, a, a greater, a, a more detailed map soon. But one of the things I'd like you to see when we look at, at Kairouan is the, the value of thinking comparatively across different source bases for the same kinds of phenomena that we're exploring. So, in, in Kairouan, well, in the, in the case of North Africa, quite a lot of scholarship has gone uh, in, in recent years to thinking about the way in which the legacies of Roman and Byzantine cities played out with the radical transformation of culture and society and politics that happened with the Islamic conquest. And um, recent syntheses have done a lot to, to demonstrate continuity. And so I'm, I'm pointing to one of them here, of course, in Fenwick's work, uh, which makes clear the, the legacy of many, many Roman cities um, into, the, uh, into the early Islamic period. And one of the things that I think her work is making clear is that early Islamic North Africa is a landscape of cities by, by, by no doubt. Um, the continuity and preservation of these Byzantine cities and late Roman cities in North Africa is somewhat at odds with what happens in the um, in the Mashrek and in what happens in the eastern part of the of the Caliphate in the same period, where we get some continuity. Jerusalem, Damascus, of course, continue on into the early Islamic period, but the the, the majority of rulers' attention goes into the creation of new cities and the foundation of new cities. Baghdad founded in 762 by al-Mansur is perhaps one of the, the best examples of this. Now, the huge new cities of the Middle East ended up reorientating the, 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 the rural production base and the whole topography of economies of the Eastern Caliphate. Um, but things played out pretty differently when we're looking at North Africa, um, partially because of the continuity of the existing cities um, and partially because of the vicissitudes of politics of, uh, in, in Islamic North Africa. Now, we as historians can apply our own heuristics to the question of what facilitates urban governance in early Islamic North Africa and what uh, we can see in terms of civic participation. But one of the things that I think that we have a responsibility to do is to ask our sources what they think, or at least uh, hear or read what they're telling us mattered to them about, uh, about urban governance and civic participation. And if we look at the accounts of Kairouan, we can see three principal um, points emerging. Uh, the early Arabic texts emphasize the history of the city and its new foundation, the centrality of the city to the Ummah, to the, to the community of the faithful, and its sacrality, the fact that it harbored these most sacred shrines 
So for 9th century historians um, like Ibn Abdul Hakam, who's, who's writing at the, at the end of the 9th century, the importance of the city lay in its foundation uh, and its early community. So Ibn Abdul Hakam re recounts the, um, the, the foundation of the city uh, by an early general, uh, Sidi Uqba, and Uqba chose the site uh, according to Ibn Abdul Hakam, uh, that was covered by impenetrable plants, filled with lions and snakes, which he miraculously expelled, defining a field of power in which he laid out the Dar al Imara, which is the, um, the, the administrative center of the new city, and the congregational mosque, the great mosque. Now that narrative, um, if you've read uh, a lot of Arabic accounts of the foundations of cities, will be a very familiar one. It's something that echoes the foundation of Fez. It's something that echoes the foundation of Baghdad in some accounts uh, as well. There's a founder of elevated status um, and origins who's got a miraculous uh, intervention transforming nature into, into urbane Islam. And it stresses these kind of elements of authority in the Islamic community drawing parallels for the new city of Kairouan um, and, and making it one of these new fabled, venerable first generation of cities, just like Kufa was or later Baghdad was uh, in the east. It, Kairouan is built anew in order to house this new world order of the conquering Islamic rule. Histories of Kairouan stress that while Kairouan was a diverse and cosmopolitan place, it was fractious and it was a place of opposition to rule as well as rulership itself. So here, sorry, you won't be able to see Kairouan. It's, it's sort of over there by the coast. Um, and here is an aerial view of the great mosque or the mosque of, of Sidi Uqba, the, the founder of Kairouan um, in its ninth century form sitting within the center of that, that modern city. Now the Aglubid rulers, that is the, the later eighth and ninth century rulers of Kairouan and the, the rulers of this sort of semi-autonomous emirate uh, of Ifriqiya, uh, who, who ruled as agents of the, of the Abbasids, but, um, but increasingly independently. They ruled from Kairouan but also they created a palace city outside of Kairouan. So, uh, so the city had its had a kind of independence. We can, we can think of other examples of this. Um, London is one where the rulers are outside of the city of, of London. Um, and this proves problematic for the Aglubids, just as it proved problematic sometimes in the case of the history of London. Um, there were a huge number of revol revolts in the ninth century history of, um, of Aglubid Kairouan, and many of them emerged and took place in these very strategic parts of the city, like the Great Mosque, or in the, the main uh, street that ran, that bisected the city. So the city was punished, or the people of the city were punished, because the buildings of the city were punished. So uh, in 810, um, the city walls are destroyed by the Aglubid ruler as a, a suppression of a, revolt that, of a revolt that emerged then in the city of Kairouan. So for the Aglubid rulers, Kairouan is, uh, is, is a source of authority until it goes wrong, and then it's a source of resistance and resurgence or insurgents. When we look at some alternative kinds of sources for the city of Kairouan, and I spent a certain amount of time looking at, um, at the accounts of, and records of the life of Sahnun, who was uh, a, a quite um, famous jurist uh, in the ninth century in, um, in, in Kairouan. He taught and lived in Kairouan, but he also made use of estates outside of the city. So sometimes he taught students in estates outside of the city. And he, he used this sort of back and forth between rural and urban um, as a way of, in some ways, dodging conflict with the Aglubid rulers who were based at Rakata at their own palatial estate outside the city. 
Sahnoon was tried in court in the city of Kairouan um, and, and was, was condemned to execution, although escaped that eventually, and then was eventually put in, in, in the position of power of the Qadi or the, the chief justice uh, in Kairouan. And Sahnoon's topography of the, the territories around Kairouan make clear that it was um, a canvas upon which resistance to political authority could be written. Now, to conclude, as I hope to have made clear, cities and urbanism, that is the investment in urban ways of life, were central to the formation of post-Roman societies in the West. They, look, they took different forms, they look different in different parts of the post-Roman West, and different cities develop along different trajectories. There's no key model for what makes a city and what makes an important city in the early Middle Ages. They evolve quite differently, although I hope to have drawn together some commonalities. One of the problems facing rulers in the early medieval West, in the Islamic world, in the Greek speaking parts of the West and, and in the Latin speaking parts of the West was legitimization of power in the post-imperial world. So that was a concern that faced all rulers. And, and they used uh, somewhat consistent strategies to achieve it. So rulers uh, pretty consistently structured forms of justice and dispute resolution. They structured um, monetization, so minted coins or facilitated and insured fiscality. They provided monopolies on military force or they, they secured monopolies on military forces and on religious authority. Those are sort of very broad um, pictures of strategies for achieving legitimization. But one of the things that I, I think um, it becomes increasingly clear to me the more I think about this and the more I work on it is the, um, the, the way in which those things took place in cities. This comparative approach to urbanism, I hope, has shown that cities were, were key to rulers' constructions of authority, but they were also places, potentially, of alternative uh, constructions of authority. And that was never binary. It wasn't that bishops could oppose rulers in cities. Sometimes bishops supported rulers in cities, but that there were opportunities for resistance um, and, and, and contradiction to rulership, just as much as there were opportunities for support. Um, cities could generate alternative income streams, could voice challenges to rulership, just as often as they could voice support and consensus for rulership. And I think it's critical to recognize that religion was most often in this period, the tool of a ruler, um, not of opposition. Occasionally it could be, but very often not. Commerce, which comes to play such a critical role in the later Middle Ages and the lives of cities in the later Middle Ages is very, very difficult for us to discern in the places that I've looked at and in the period that I've looked at. Now, a conventional view to this problem, and perhaps a, a more conventional approach to this lecture, would have been to line up a series of narratives about processions of people following relics and, um, and bishops leading the populace out to meet a ruler and then bringing them together to a church. We can think of dozens and dozens and dozens of examples of those from Rome, from, um, uh, from Ravenna, from uh, saint Riquier, from all over the place. But what I've tried to do instead of that perhaps more familiar view of the way in which civic participation worked in the early Middle Ages is to think about um, ways in which we can read sources against the grain or read different sources, if not against the grain, at least obliquely to try to understand perhaps less consensus and more resistance in the early Middle Ages. Thank you. So I'm very happy to take questions. Um, 
I'm not exactly sure what the best way for us to do that is. Should we take questions in chat? Well, first of all, let me switch off, switch on my camera. Thank you very much for this most intriguing lecture. Uh, I'm really impressed and I'm uh, really grateful that you didn't uh, choose the examples that you just <laughs> described that would fit perfectly well into one theme. But uh, actually, I think the, the lecture made it so much clearer that there are different types of governance, uh, although very different examples that you gave. I mean, uh, the idea is still there. Uh, and uh, uh, I, no matter how you transcend it geographically, spatially, temporarily, uh, religiously even, uh, the idea of the urban governance is there, although just uh, used in a different uh, uh, manner. So I, I think uh, we'll have a lot of questions. Uh, I I'm uh, glad to open the floor. I would suggest, though, uh, I'm sure that there will be really many questions, but I would suggest that we uh, prioritize uh, the questions from the students first and uh, then go to the uh, to the other public, if you wouldn't mind that. Sure, that sounds great. Absolutely. OK. Who would like to to jump in? I see Joshua Duffield. Yes, I think question. that yeah. there is a, a question uh, in in the chat. Hi, so I do have a bit of a question. Um, when we're looking at these cities and we're seeing how the different rulers are either using them or how the city themselves is being used to ferment um, a counter idea to what the ruler wants, how do rulers handle, especially in this late Roman example, how do they handle when there are multiple cities that have meaning to them? So not just like a capital city, but for instance, when um, say you have the actual cultural city of Rome, but you also have it being eclipsed by other now larger, more prosperous cities. I believe like a not, yeah, like a Mediolanum and others like that. Uh, how did emperors or just the rulers and kings handle uh, those kind of situations? Well, um, so so sometimes they um, they 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 took trips. So I'm thinking of Charlemagne coming to Rome. Now Charlemagne came to Rome for a number of different reasons, but but one of them, I think, was to uh, to leave his mark and and to put his imprint on the city of Rome, uh, and to um, capitalize on the legitimization that Rome provided. Rome is perhaps a, a pretty exceptional example into all of this, uh, in, in all of this. But, but yes, uh, M Milan is also important, um, rising in importance. Other cities are rising in importance. One way in which rulers, I think, um, stretched out their authority or their uh, engagement with other cities is patronage. So founding churches, donating to churches, donating resources and estates to churches is one principal way of, um, of, of leaving a mark uh, and of contributing to the life, the civic life of, of a given city, even if you're not physically present there all the time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, good. Okay. I think Laurent Kiss had had a question, and then I'll give the word uh, to Isidore, uh, who has uh, written the, his question in the chat. Maybe uh, he would like to to pose it. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Caroline, for the for the very good lecture. I, actually, I had one thing in mind. You mentioned how. Basically, the institutions and the bureaucracy and administration and titles and power hierarchies of Roman states uh, just survived after the collapse of the Roman Empire and how this is represented in, like, for example, in, in the case of Marseille in the city's documents. And I was just wondering if, um, if the tradition of the Greek polis also survived and if there are any spatial differences, like for example, uh, in the Western Roman Empire, 
texts emphasize the continuity with the Roman Empire with the Latin antiquity and in the Eastern uh, Roman Empire, maybe uh, uh, CC texts emphasize a, a continuity with the Greek Polish tradition. I, I don't know if, if that's the case, but I was just wondering if, if there are any kind of uh, differences in that or something. Um, so that, that's a really interesting question. Um, the, the polis had, by the time we get to the year 500, undergone so much transformation uh, that in the Eastern Roman Empire, there is a very strong tradition of civic identity, but it's, it's very squarely tied into the administration of the late Roman Empire. So um, if in terms of the polis you're referring to the, the kind of collective governance by the democracy, um, that's not present in, the, in Ephesus or Constantinople or Antioch or the great cities of the East, um, even in Athens. Um, what you do get are very strong institutions of um, of, of, of Roman style civic authority, whereby you have offices of prefects, of senators, of, of, of other figures, and you get um, and, and you get govern collective governance in the form of senates or of, um, of of civic officials and administrations. I mean, you get these sort of elected groups that 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 are responsible for local governance, but it's very much in the in the model of the Roman kind of pyramidal structure, not the the, the model of the polis. Um, it would be incredibly interesting to think about and to try to ask oneself, what did um, the municipal government of Athens think about the uh, classical democracy? Um, but I think think it would be really challenging to answer that question. I think there's a real rupture in discontinuity. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Isidore, would you like to, to, to raise your question in person, or should I yeah. raise it for you? No, it's, it's fine. I can do it. <laughs> I'll manage somehow. <laughs> uh, so thank you again, Carolyn. Interesting and um, eloquent presentation. Uh, so I had many, many questions about it because I'm also like uh, researching early modern um, urban or pre-urban settlements in central, central Europe, uh, mostly like sort of like fort cities um, to some extent. But I want to focus because it's more connected to your topic about incastellamento and especially in relation to the urban development in uh, 9th to 11th century in uh, Italy. Uh, what would you say were the causes? How did it happen? Uh, go, go, go for it. Well, okay, so in Castellamento is a phenomenon that emerges, well, there's a certain amount of debate. Um, archaeologists would say it starts in the 7th century in central Italy, um, and historians would generally say that it starts in the very late 10th, but mostly 11th century. Um, and what we're talking about is the movement of people from sparse settlement into nucleated settlements, often on hilltops, often, often in, um, in sort of naturally fortified contexts. And in the case of the archaeological record, what you see is the foundation of new settlements. And in case of the, of the textual record, what you see are documents of in, is in Castellamento, in which um, a bishop or a ruler grants um, to a certain number of people the rights to have houses in a certain place uh, and at a kind of gives them a sort of package deal of, um, of, of protected and sometimes um, uh, communities with, with immunities like with certain rights. So this is a really interesting phenomenon. Um, if you want to ask me what when did it start, um, I think the answer is probably both. That there's there is movement from sparse settlement to nucleated settlements in the seventh century, but not a lot of it. And there is in Castellamento in the documentary record in the late tenth and the eleventh century, and it has a lot to do with emerging ideas about the legality and um, and and legal formulation of quasi-urban communities. So you can have unfortified 
in Castelamento. You can have rural in Castelamento. You can have all kinds of different permutations, but it's more a kind of political theory than a practical form, I think. Um, so how does this relate to what I've been talking about? Well, one of the things that that um, that, em that emerges in this period is the, the sort of allure and attraction of urban living, which is more attractive in some parts of the world than others. Like no one in France is really that interested in urban living <laughs> until you get way down into the 11th century. But people in Italy are very, very interested in urban living. And so sparse settlement isn't that appealing for people of aspiring social status in Southern Italy. And so that's, that's why you get people organizing themselves in these ways that, that mimic or that echo distant ancient imperial structures, I think. Yeah, just to follow up on this uh, on this issue because it's very interesting and I think would you say that it's also connected to the continuity with the Roman Empire and structures uh, architecture if you will uh, because we can definitely say that in Italy there was more continuity than there was in northern France or I don't know where uh, so what would you say um, I think that's one explanation for it. I think that's definitely one explanation for it. That the fact that there are still these big cities lying around, but there are big cities lying around what's now Turkey, and there are big cities lying around what's now uh, Bosnia and Serbia and Bulgaria, and they don't take those same forms. Um, so uh, uh, people don't organize themselves in quite the same way. Uh, so I think a lot of it has to do again, everything gets tied up with the nature of our source material. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that certain things that people did in cities in Italy promoted new forms of legality. So the fact that there was a notarial class that was based in cities, not in monasteries in Italy, means that writing and communication by writing happened in cities rather than in monasteries. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm making some gross generalizations there, but there's a, there's a way in which the kind of practicalities of living depended on cities in the Italian peninsula much more than in Iberia or in Gaul or in Britain or in Bulgaria. And so what that then does is it just sort of creates a virtuous cycle of reinforcing the, the, the cult of cityness, right? The appeal of, of urban forms of living, um, even in places that are hardly cities, they still call themselves cities and they still present themselves as cities in Italy because of these kind of uh, dependencies on structures of, of administration and ways of doing things that are peculiar to Italy. So, so I, that's what I think is going on there. Um, I think Italy is certainly the most urban part of the post-Roman world by a very, very, very long shot. And so on the one hand, it's a really useful case study for testing out these ideas. On the other hand, it's slightly problematic because it is just so much more urban than, than anywhere else. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, just, just the one uh, comment brief on this because I come from Slovenia and this is like border of Italy or even part of it was uh, in Italy. Uh, and it, it is, as you said, like the older cities are practically abandoned and the new settlements are established, whether uh, on the high ground in the mountains or, in the, or on the hilltops uh, or on the outskirts of these former cities. Yeah. So the ruins are actually left alone. This was not as the newcomers were living. And yeah, but as you said, there wasn't this tradition. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is there other question that I'm not seeing a uh, hands rising a reason or uh, maybe I'm missing somebody from the chat? I don't really see. Oh, Kathleen Zende, of course. Please. 
Yeah, thank you very much. If there are no more questions for the students, uh, I would also like to, to thank you for your talk and for engaging with issues in such a comprehensive way. I think that's something which uh, made us think very much about comparisons and commonalities between the examples. And one feature which you repeatedly mentioned was factionalism, that uh, all these settlements were characterized by these factions. And uh, could you elaborate a bit more on the nature? What was the, the claim or the purpose of the factions? Is there, are there some common traits or were factions in each uh, settlement uh, fighting for different issues and fighting against each other in a different way? Thank you. Um, thank you. That, that's a really, um, that's a very interesting and very difficult question to answer. Um, so what are the circus factions in Constantinople doing? Well, um, they are, they're providing a framework for um, social negotiation. And the fighting between blues and greens is fighting for neighborhood rights or it's fighting for um, uh, different degrees of, um, of kind of interventions. So people argue about access to water or fountains and they argue in terms of blues or in greens. Um, factions appear in in every society, right? The sort of the in groups and out groups uh, appear all over the place um, in the present day and in, and in the medieval past as well. Um, very often, historians are able to see that kind of factionalism in terms of social orders, right? So we get peasant revolts, or we get um, uh, we get riots for people demanding bread and and food when they don't have it and so we can see we can see the sort of the underdogs fighting the their rulers uh, and that's different from factionalism that i'm kind of talking about where i'm talking about the sort of kind of uh, competition um and and structures of social organisms or structural organization that happen in cities um around the well in Benevento you see it in terms of the Beneventans against the Amalfitans right the Amalfitans live in a separate neighborhood and they have their own community and their own church and they argue with the Beneventans about other things I think part of it is the you know the very nature of urbanism creates environments of competition competition for resources principally that's what urban density creates and so we then have to look at how that competition plays out um, and, and looking at factionalism and looking at rebellions and looking at peasant revolts and, and those kinds of social order um, struggles uh, are, are other ways that we can do it. But I'm, I'm interested in seeing how that, um, how, it, how it manifests topographically. Uh, and that's, that's where I can see it. But I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's so people have often said with reference to the to the Constantinople and to the ancient Roman charioteers as that they're sort of like football clubs, as though that's a kind of meaningless, um, you know, it doesn't it's not it's not about anything really it's just you 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 root for Manchester United or you root for Manchester City and it's not no substantial difference, but I think there were really significant. Um, it, identities and and community politics that were played out in these in these different competitions um, and it can I mean it can manifest in a bunch of different ways I mean if we wanted to move forward, for, forward in time we could see these things playing out in terms of competition between saints cults and different communities rivaling for um, for attention around saints cults it's part of the frictions that emerge in urban living and so I think we so I think it's worth paying attention to them. Thank you very much. Uh, if you'd allow me one question from on my side, uh, and it, it's kind of a follow up on the, the last sentence that you just uh, said about the relics and the translation of relics. Can you really relate the translation of relics in a certain period in a certain place uh, to 
the rulership uh, legitimation claims, or is it really a civic participation in the governance of the cities? Hmm. What do you think? Um, well, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question, isn't it? So uh, you know, the standard, at least in the Latin sources, the standard way in which translations are framed, or or a common way in which translations of relics are framed, is that there's a consensus of the populace. So when Gennaro's body is taken, all of Benevento goes to Naples and with the ruler and takes the body and comes back. I mean, I'm not saying that actually happened, but I'm saying that that's what the account emphasizes. And so there's a there's a rhetorical strategy in the literature to play up the participation. So in the account of um, when Pope Paschal translates all of those relics into Rome, and there's that inscription with a list of them, there's also an account in the Liber Pontificalis, which stresses that, that people assisted him and met the relics and brought them into the city. So it, there is this sort of cult um, of community that's part of these relic translations. Um, the sources, though, are so um contrived if that makes sense at least for my period um that, that you never sort of haphazardly come across information of a relic translation it's always there's a miraculous discovery it's always there's a divine intervention it's often sort of often with the support of the ruler or at least the patronage of the ruler um so there's there's always a, a political agenda at play in information about a translation. It's very hard to imagine a community spontaneously undertaking a translation and then post factum, the, the rulers or the local institutions of the, of, the, of the church becoming involved, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think well, it's, yes, it's, a, it it's a manifestation of well, because you mentioned, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm directly paralleling some things that were uh, uh, happening uh, in uh, post-Byzantine, let's say, uh, era, uh, at least in, in the area that I'm most uh, familiar with, uh, different parts of the Balkans. And uh, the, the translation of relics is uh, always uh, at, at a time of trouble. Yeah. And that would uh, mean that the ruler himself is searching for some a representation, first legitimation, of course, uh, of a sort, but then there is this civic participation as well, which is also uh, put at play at the same time. And it's uh, it shouldn't be also forgotten. I mean, it's not only uh, because you also mentioned that those translations of relics happened at a certain time period with where the, when the tensions between cities and rulers, uh, local rulers were very high. So. I was just wondering there whether this is uh, translatable at the same period. I think it is. I think it absolutely is. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any further questions? Susanne, please. So thank you, Caroline, um, for this uh, wonderful lecture. I'm, I'm not so of, often in the early Middle Ages. And um, so this was really much to learn for me. One, one thing um, uh, we have seen is these, the emergence of many new cities um, but also, as you emphasized, um, in different forms <laughs> and that there is no unique model or, of course, not a unique, but um, no kind of standard mod model after um, yeah, in that period. But anyway, um, um, as we have, let's say, metaphorically speaking, <laughs> after the end of the Roman Empire, um, a kind of uh, tabula rasa in, in, in many ways. Um, there is, at least um, theoretically, um, uh, the, the, something yeah, that made things possible um, on this, um, perhaps um models um emerged um 
in that period where no clear um, uh, ruler, at least not the Romans, <laughs> governed <laughs> half of Europe. Europe. So what in the end interests me is if you can see um, despite the, the variety, if you can identify motivations for uh, building cities, the new foundation, uh, or even from the people, the motivations to live in cities um, and not on the countryside, um, uh, of, from, uh, from the point of view of different religions. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there uh, I don't know, an inclination by Christianity to go to cities and to build the cities more than in Islam? Or um, can you see, can you say anything about that? Or other researchers, perhaps you, yeah, that, <laughs> from your a, period? <laughs> that's a very, very interesting question. Um, so it is conventionally said that Islam is an urban religion, right? Mm -hmm. The dictates of the religion require the, the convening of the men of a community on Fridays in the congregational mosque. Yeah. Um, and indeed, the prophet was, a, was from an urban context. And so all of the kind of structures of, of, and, and values of living based on, um, on the hadith are about the um, are about urban living. That's perhaps an over exaggeration, but I think it is fundamentally true that the structures that produced the texts that we have about early Islam were urban, right? So libraries and book production and um, scholarship and legal uh, um, frameworks are all happening in urban contexts in the Islamic world. In the West, that's, that's not true. I tried to make the case earlier in response to, to, to one of the questions that the peculiarities of writing in Italy meant uh, a furtherance of urban ways of living. I don't think that's religious. I think that's about municipal notaries as having, having, a, having a, an important role, a key role that 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 notaries don't have elsewhere in the west they tend to be attached to monasteries in the west uh, in elsewhere in the west so i don't think it's religion there and in fact um if anything monasteries in the west are I mean, I gave a, I set a reading, which I didn't speak to, which is about urban monasteries in, in Northern Italy. But the, the model of monasticism in the West is non-urban. And monasteries for better or worse are the, the kind of longest lived institutions in the West um, in, after the Roman empire. They live for generations, they outlive rulers and they outlive kings and kingdoms and all of the rest. Um, and they are not exclusively, but they are by ideal rural and removed and withdrawn from civilization. So I think there are some religious tensions around this principle of urbanism and where people invest their, their interests in cities. In terms of why people might move to cities or why people might nucleate their settlements, why people might move into nucleated settlements. Um, that's, that's a very difficult one to answer before the 11th century. By the time we get to the 11th century, I would say, well, economic opportunities, uh, the, the sort of big uptick, uptick in regional trade means that cities become commercial interests in the 11th century that they hadn't been before. But the degree to which they hadn't been before is very, very strong. Like, like we have these very exceptional documents like the one from Marseille, or we have these very exceptional moments of silk arriving in London or in Rome, but those are like extremely rare. So economic opportunity is not an explanation for urbanism in, in the period before the 11th century, as far as I'm concerned. So I think in answer to your question, I've kind of come at it from both angles, right? Yes, there's a religious ideal, but it's not uh, explicit or dominant. And 
whatever role um, cities play in economies or economy plays in cities, it's not one, I think, that explains people migrating to cities until you get to the 11th century. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I think at that point we should uh, kind of conclude uh, before exhausting you too much. <laughs> After one, one and a half hour of talking, it was extremely, extremely interesting. Uh, uh, we thank you uh, for, for the wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, thank you all for participating and taking part in, in the lecture series and for your interest. Uh, I hope that we see each other uh, on next week as well. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, it was wonderful. Thank thanks, you. Thanks very much for having me, and 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 thanks for thanks for your interesting questions and comments.